Hey, hey everyone. Um, thank you for letting me uh, speak in front of you all today. Um, like uh, Wesley said, I graduated here from Cal State Long Beach um, and I went through the design program. So it's, it's awesome for me to like kind of come back and talk to you guys all about what I do and kind of how I got to where I'm at. So with that being said, yes, my name is Kayvon Mehranian. I'm Associate Creative Director at an experiential marketing company called Sparks. And I guess kind of Wesley already gave that intro, but it was in mine too, so I'm going <laughs> to say it again. Um, so some of you may be wondering, what is experiential marketing? Um, I kind of decided to like just pull a something offline because uh, I'll probably say something and it won't make very much sense. So Experiential marketing is a marketing strategy that immerses customers within a product or deeply engages them. In short, experiential marketing enables consumers to not just buy products or services from a brand, but to actually experience uh, the brand. Pretty much, we, uh, we create cool shit. Um, you know, our, we create unique experiences that showcase a brand um, and their product. That's me right there at uh, an event we did. Um, we did a little Instagramable moment. You'll be hearing me say that a lot over the course of this uh, presentation. Um, so before we get into kind of what I do, I thought it'd be beneficial to kind of show you how I got there. And I've got kind of three different sections I'm going to go through. Uh, one is like the journey, how I got to where I'm at. Um, and then two is kind of work, the working world, uh, and then three, some of the projects that I've been working on, have worked on and, and uh, ha are working on. And I'm going to kind of pause in between um, some of the, uh, the sections and, uh, and try to like look over. So if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to, I think you could like raise a hand um, in the uh, chat or just chat something and I'll do my best to kind of answer some questions. All right, so first section, uh, the journey. Um, I kind of picked this windy road image. I thought it was super fitting because um, I didn't take a straight path to get where I'm at. And um, I took a lot of turns um, and it took me a while to get and figure out exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so that's why I kind of picked this picture. Um, so uh, how did you get to where you're at? Um, I grew up in Long Beach, like Wesley said. Um, I pretty much did all my schooling there. Um, after I graduated high school, I went and did community college. And you know, I kind of did what most college students do. I had some fun, I partied, did all that stuff. And it took me five years to kind of figure out that I needed to figure something out. Um, you know, at one point I thought I wanted to do engineering. Um, I thought I wanted to do urban planning. I thought I wanted to do architecture. At one point, I didn't even know what I wanted to do. But anyways, I was 23 years old, five years later, and I just really needed to, to get out of there, you know? Um, and, and I also look back and like most of my friends were graduating or they were on the path to graduating. And so, I felt behind. Um, so five years go by and, uh, you know, did I figure it out? Um, I thought I did, you know, I, I transferred to Cal State Long Beach into the design program. At the time um, when I was at community college, I was taking uh, drafting classes. Um, and so I kind of, I kind of figured, you know what, maybe I should go the architecture route. Um, and I knew that at Cal State Long Beach, they had an interior architecture program. Um, it was also my local college. So it was kind of a little easier for me to get into uh, transferring from a, a community college. It's also my hometown. You know, I can still live at home, see my friends, do all that stuff. So as you guys all know, uh, I think most of you guys are design students. So, you know, they've got the industrial design program, they've got the interior architecture program, and then they have the regular design uh, program. And so, you know, I thought that I wanted to do the architecture. So I kind of jumped on that, um, that path and started taking those classes. I then found myself not liking interior architecture as much as I thought I did. Um, I'm very much like uh, this guy from The Hangover, where 
there was too many choices. I was taking some of these classes and, you know, I was picking hardware, hardware, paint colors, tiles, materials, things like that. And I think I got a little overwhelmed uh, on a lot of those things. And I kind of look back now, it's funny because I do a lot of that same stuff now where I'm picking materials and picking colors. So, you know, at the time it was overwhelming. Now, you know, I've been doing it for so long. It's just become, you know, second nature for myself. But I think it's okay to be a little overwhelmed. You know, you kind of got to just persevere and get through those times. So I also, at the time, I think I just wasn't good enough uh, for the interior design program. Um, I remember I was taking one of those beginning interior architecture classes. Um, I can't remember, I think it was space planning. And I think one of the assignments was we had to design a, a loft or a house. And let's just say that the design that I did back then isn't something that I would design now. Um, I remember like the kitchen was like very outdated, even for that time when I was in there. Um, I also put in a huge aquarium um, that like spanned like two, two floors. I remember like drawing like sharks in there and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, the, the teacher didn't, didn't quite like uh, my designs, but, you know, maybe I was ahead of my time. Who knows? But uh, anyways, I, I started to think that interior architecture just wasn't for me. And my drawing skills uh, weren't as great, you know, um, and I don't know if it is the same now, but at least when I was going to school, a lot of this stuff was was done by hand. Um, we would use the computer here and there, but a majority of our classes, you know, we were sketching floor plans. Um, if we want to do a perspective shot, we had to draw all that and then do marker renderings. So it was a lot. And if your drawing skills, you know, aren't up to par, then you, it, it becomes a little harder for some than others. So did I give up? Um, uh, no, of course not. Um, so I switched into the regular design uh, major and I took a class in environmental design and exhibit design. And I learned about, I also took a 3D, um, a 3D modeling class. So I learned about modeling, uh, a brand identity through the exhibit uh, class. Also at the time, one of the instructors, um, his name is Sanimal Silva, he uh, taught the exhibit class, which Wesley teaches now. Uh, and he took us on like a tour of GPJ. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with that company, they're a experiential marketing agency as well. They're actually one of our competitors, but he worked there and he took us on a tour of, of, the, um, uh, of his company. And I thought there was so much cool stuff. I mean, we were looking at, you know, sketches, renderings, uh, design studios. They also had a fabrication um, warehouse. And I was like, man, this is some, this is some cool stuff. It's also, if for those that aren't familiar with experiential marketing, it's a fast paced industry. You know, you are, you're not working on something for like three years or you're very rarely working on something for that long. Um, I think the longest project that I've worked on is, is maybe like eight months, but it's a very fast paced industry. So uh, we took that tour JPJ. I, I was like, you know what? I like this stuff. And I also liked the exhibit class and the environmental class and the modeling class. So I started to, I wouldn't say I was bad at what I was doing. I just started to excel even more. So um, it's all downhill from there. Uh, you know, not quite. Um, I was working my internship and finishing up my last year at Cal State Long Beach, doing my senior project. I was preparing uh, my resume, my portfolio. I was also thinking um, job after college. Um, and then, you know, I was fortunate enough to be living at home. So I was kinda, I was kind of thinking like, once I graduate college, get a job, I'm not gonna be able to live ho at home anymore. You know, I'm not gonna be able to enjoy that meatloaf. Um, so, um, so then, yeah, so then I graduated. Um, I did well on my senior project. I actually uh, got chosen to do the, the senior show. 
I graduated in 2014, which um, I guess it doesn't seem like a long time ago, but I guess eight years um, goes by fast. I didn't quite have a job going out of college. I, I, it's kind of, I, I kind of had one, but I kind of didn't have one. It was also 2014 was the year of the World Cup, and I'm like a super big um, soccer fan. Um, so I thought, you know, hey, for the next several months after I graduate, the World Cup's going to be going on. How about I not do shit? You know, how about I just relax at home and not do anything? So for this, for the next six months, I took that time. Um, I did some traveling. Obviously, I watched the World Cup. I did some traveling. Um, and then I didn't really do anything. Um, and I think that that's good. I look back now and I think that like, I'm glad I took that time off of college. I mean, not everybody's as fortunate enough to do that. Don't, you know, don't say like, I'm going to quit my job and do all that stuff. But I was fortunate enough to be living home. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I took that time off because later on, once I got into the working world, you know, it's a grind when you first get in there, um, especially out of college, because you want to establish yourself. Um, and you work hard, you work long hours, you know, you really, um, really want to show what you're, uh, what you can do. And also you want to learn a lot. So it's hard to just go ahead and be like, Hey, I'm going to start at this company out of college and be like, I'm going to take like two weeks off. It's just, it's not as easy. I mean, I'm, I'm sure every company is different, but you also want to kind of make a name for yourself. So for those that, you know, are looking to graduate after here and, and don't have anything immediately lined up, I think it's okay, you know, take a little time, you know, uh, we all talk about mental health uh, nowadays, take that time off, kind of recharge, and then hit the ground running. Uh, so the interview process. So once I, that six months went by, um, I think I finally was like, well, I don't know if it was finally more than my dad just coming into my room every morning saying, are you going to get a job? Um, but I started to go out there, started applying and the applying for job process can be, it can sometimes be a discouraging, um, thing. And I went on a bunch of in interviews, um, and some were great, some weren't so great, um, and I think I just tried to do as many as I can because you think naturally that the more you go on, the easier they become. And I, and I think that's somewhat accurate. Um, they still don't get easy. Um, so yeah, some of the things that I think you can kind of prepare yourself for that interview process is, um, you know, sharpening your skills, um, you know, whether you're doing tutorials, um, learning from friends, things like that. Always make sure that your, your skills are sharp or you're learning new stuff. Keep up to date with trends. Um, so I have like a handful of blogs I try to read um, here and there. You know, I follow uh, designers on Instagram, Twitter, things like that. You just always want to keep up with, with, with those trends. Update your resume and portfolio. Um, this is like a big thing, especially as a designer. When you go into a job interview, you're going to need to show your portfolio. Um, you know, a lot of times we have an online portfolio. Make sure that thing is up to date. You know, and like in our, like I said, in our industry, that's how you you know get that job. Is they look at your resume and then they look at your portfolio and they see the work that you've done. So, and then also make sure you kind of craft your your portfolios correctly. Don't, don't put, you know, like 30 different projects in there, put your best work, you know, put your best foot forward. Um, so, and then another thing I want to kind of touch on too is maintain your relationships, you know, like you're in these classes with your other students, with your other classmates. I've gotten two jobs because of classmates that I knew. Um, and I wouldn't say, that was the sole reason that I got that job. Obviously, you know, my portfolio and my resume spoke for itself, but I did get my foot in the door faster than somebody else did. Um, so maintain those relationships, uh, whether they're friendships um, through your classmates, um, uh, through LinkedIn. And then um, I, I kind of touched on uh, one of the instructors giving us a tour of GPJ. He now works with me at uh, Sparks. 
So again, like, you know, you never know who you're going to end up working with or working for. Um, so, so again, kind of, you know, maintain those relationships. Um, okay, I kind of, I don't know if I flew by too quickly, but that was kind of just like the first half of, of kind of the journey. Um, if you guys don't have any questions on kind of that process, I'll kind of just keep on rolling through this, but feel free to kind of stick a hand up if you, if you have a question and I'll, I'll try to answer. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep, keep going, keep jamming here. All right, cool. So the work. Um, so first job out of college. Again, it was a, a friend of mine through school. Um, I, I reached out to him to pass along my resume and, uh, and I got hired. Um, this one, the company was called the marketing arm and it was a grind and, um, it, it like, it really, I mean, I was working, working hard, working long hours. Um, I got a ton of experience. Um, I also learned a lot on my own too. Cause like I was, um, like one of the only person, uh, one of the only, uh, people in the company that, uh, use 3D Studio Max, and I was like the only modeler at the company. So the first couple of years working there, I was learning everything by myself. Um, I didn't have somebody to ask, hey, how do I model that? Or how do I do that? It was either look it up on a tutorial on YouTube or figure it out myself. And, and you know, it was at the time too, we had some projects and some deadlines that were pretty crazy. And I remember just like, burning through hours because I was trying to figure out exactly how to do it. So it, it was definitely, like I said, definitely a grind. Um, but you know, sometimes it's almost like that's the way you learn the best is like when you're put under pressure. Um, so the, the team I, I worked for, um, the account that we worked on was Nintendo, um, which was, we did a lot of fun stuff. It was almost like kind of being like a big kid, um, we were responsible for designing activations for game launches, um, and as well as kind of like doing these events, which ultimately drive consumers to kind of purchase uh, the products that we're showcasing. So we did a couple different programs. Uh, we primarily focused on mall tours, which were done in the winter time, as well as the um, it was done in the winter time as well as the, the summer. Um, and then a couple other projects I worked on was Splatoon. Um, depending on how familiar you are with like the gaming industry, um, Splatoon was like a, a, a big game for the Wii U at the time. So we did like a little launch for that game. And then we did a, a big um, event launch for the Nintendo Switch. Um, so here's just kind of an example of, uh, this is one of the first projects I worked on at this company. This was the, this is an example of like the mall program. Uh, it was a 20 by 20, um, uh, space that we would get and we would build, uh, I think we would build somewhere in between five to 10 and let's just say eight. Um, and we would place these in, uh, in malls across the United States. So build eight in eight different locations across the US. And since it was a winter program, we usually um, activated during the, the winter holidays. So we would activate on, um, on Black Friday and run till Christmas. And you can kind of see what we're doing here is we're inviting you know, parents to bring their kids, have fun, play the game, and ultimately, try to encourage them to, you know, buy a device or buy a game, um, you know, and that's kind of like what we do is like the return on your investment. So making sure that I would say making sure, but we, we do these experiences so that, you know, kids could have fun. They think of something memorable and hopefully, you know, their parents, it's Christmas time, they buy them something nice, uh, specifically a Nintendo product. Um, the summer program is very similar. Um, so instead of it being activated on the same day for the same amount of time, what we do for the summer program is we had a larger space. I think we had maybe like a 50 by 50 or I think even larger at one point. 
but we built one of them and then we would um it was a, essentially like a road show so we would it be in trucks it would activate in a certain city um it would show up uh it activate over the weekend, it would pack its stuff up and then go to the next city. And it would do that to multiple cities across the United States. And the same concept is, you know, to drive brand awareness um, in the hopes that um, that parents ultimately buy, you know, their kids some of these Nintendo products. Um, this next project, this one was, uh, this one was pretty fun and, uh, it, it was kind of a bit of a nightmare for us when we were both setting up and dismantling it. And so each company's a little bit different. This company I originally worked at, uh, the marketing arm was a little bit more hands-on where I would, you know, it was like boots on the ground. I was there setting things up with other guys that we hired um, to set the things up. Where some companies, they have a whole team dedicated to that. So we're a little bit um, kind of like a, um, a smaller team and did a little bit more of that stuff. Um, and I'm glad I did because I got that experience and really kind of understand like the nuts and bolts of kind of setting some of this stuff up. Um, so this one was a game launched for Splatoon, um, a new game on Nintendo Wii. Uh, where we took over the Santa Monica Pier. Um, uh, this one was a, a bit crazy because the objective of the game was to spray uh, your team's ink everywhere. So we ultimately created an obstacle course full of colored ink. And then we kind of pitted two teams up against one another. Um, along with this, we had like another area where like um, people can kind of also play the game and interact with that. Um, but this was like a fun, cool obstacle course that, well, I mean, there was ink everywhere. And I'll play this video to kind of give you a sense of, of what we did. I'm surprised nobody like blew an ACL out of this thing or hurt themselves. The ink was pretty slippery. Yeah, so we, uh, we took over Santa Monica Pier, um, and I remember when we were like also dismantling. As, well, just to kind of touch on the activation and, and the game itself, what we tried to do was really, you know, bring that game to life um, and create like a fun experience uh, centered around that game. Um, I was going to talk about like how uh, when we were dismantling some of these uh, pieces, I remember... Um, we worked all through the night. I think I went home at like four in the morning and you, we couldn't spray any, the ink was everywhere and we couldn't spray any of it down with like a large hose. We were like going around with like little sprayers. Um, I think at the time it was like, they were worried about the drought and what it would look like to spray it down with water. But it like the ink went everywhere and it was, it was crazy, but um, it was a fun experience. Uh, it lasted a couple of days and, and uh, we had a couple of competitions. Um, this next, this next project, this one, uh, this was kind of my last project at the company. Um, they, this was the launch of the, the Nintendo switch. Um, and it was a pretty unique project because at the time this kind of, I don't know if it like revolutionized, but it definitely ch changed the handheld gaming industry a bit. It was like, kind of like the first coming out that like had that large screen and the controllers, 
anyways, they were super secretive about this. Um, and I remember, you know, we, one, we had to get another office like outside of um, our company so that like only people working on that project could see what we were working on. And then also, you know, for the first, I would say like couple months of working on this project, I didn't even know what the device looked like. Um, so we were ultimately like designing this project blindly. Um, they gave us a few concept um, sketches of some like the games and the characters and stuff, but we didn't even know what the product looked like. So we had to kind of design um, design a project um, without some of those parameters. So really interesting. It was fun. Um, and I'll kind of show you uh, a little bit. I'll show you a clip about the video or a clip about the uh, event. And, you know, one of the coolest things about some of these projects is when you're able to like go on site and see people interacting with things that you design. I think that's an awesome experience, um, you know, especially like looking at kind of the, the, the smiles on these kids' faces and you're like, I designed that experience for them. Um, so it's a pretty powerful moment. Um, and, you know, when you get out into the design world and you're able to kind of see some of that stuff, I think you guys will, will certainly uh, like it. All right, so um, so my my time was up at my first job out of college uh, at the marketing arm, and I was getting a little burned out. I think I told you guys I was working long hours. I was the only 3D designer at the company, so I was doing a lot of stuff. Um, and so this kind of brings me to an important aspect of kind of like the working world. I think it's, you know, it's always great to, you know, know your worth, you know, don't be afraid to ask for things that you deserve, you know, also make sure that you're, you know, somewhat reasonable, you know, uh, don't go in there guns blazing. Um, at the time I knew I was doing a lot to bring in business um, and I kind of wanted to be paid fairly. Um, and, you know, when you, when you do that, make sure you, you know, back it up with numbers, you know, bring, make sure you, you back it, back it up with facts. Um, you know, did you help gain more business? Did you take on more responsibilities? Anything that can help your case for either a raise or promotion, make sure you do that. Um, so obviously they didn't show, show me the money. Um, no, but I, I think they didn't quite, um, you know, meet what I had been hoping for. I also think that it was kind of my time was up there. You know, um, I had spent two years there. It was my first job out of college. Um, we were strictly a design company and I kind of wanted to little, learn a little bit more about the build process. Um, so the next company I jumped to was a design and build. Oh, oh backwards. Uh, okay. So, uh, so it's my second job and then it's my, actually my current job. So, um, I currently work at Sparks, um, and uh, again, I kind of touched on a couple of the other slides, how I got my foot in the door at my first job was knowing a classmate. Well, this job uh, too, I also knew a classmate that worked here and he got my foot in the door, uh, kind of sped up the process. And then ultimately, you know, I, um, uh, you know, I showed my portfolio, my resume, and then, you know, 
they ultimately look at that to kind of make the final decision. But, you know, there is an incentive, you know, for companies to have their employees refer somebody. So it's always good. I mean, you would hope that, you know, or at least if I'm going to refer somebody, I'm going to make sure they damn well can, can do their job, you know, otherwise it looks bad on you. Um, so, you know, the referral process is a big thing at companies. Um, so, you know, use, use your relationships that you have, whether it's friends, you know, colleagues, um, even, you know, your teachers. Um, so I've been at the company, it's been a little over five years now. Um, I, you know, I worked my way up. I started as a junior designer. Now I'm an associate creative director. And, you know, I've learned it a ton on the way. I feel like I, I'm, I'm constantly learning. And with, you know, with what has been going on over the last couple of years, I found myself learning even more again. Um, so, you know, when you get into those jobs, act like, act like sponges, you know, absorb everything. Don't ever think that uh, you know it all because, you know, it, like there's a ton of stuff out there to continue to learn more. All right, so hopefully you guys are still awake um, and I didn't bore you guys too much, but all right. So finally, um, what do I do? Um, and it, just to kind of touch on all, I thought all this stuff was kind of beneficial because you know, I eight years ago, I don't know, I feel like it wasn't too long ago and I was in your shoes. I mean, I took this exact same class and list listen to some of these instructors uh, or some of these uh, lectures. Um, and, and so I just felt that, you know, it was beneficial to kind of, I wouldn't say know my life story, but at least somewhere from where I, you know, started my college to where I got in terms of my working, uh, my career. So you guys probably want to know what I do, or at least the life of designer at uh, Sparks, or even just a, a designer in experiential marketing. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through some of that stuff uh, with you and kind of show you some, some work that I do. Um, so just kind of to touch on as, as a company sparks, I kind of took this stuff from some of our capes pitches, but I kind of wanted to just show you guys what we do at sparks, all the different, um, kind of departments we have. And, you know, every company is different. Um, some have some of these, some have more than these. Um, so, uh, just kind of give you an idea of what we do. So we have a department, uh, that's. Uh, deals with strategy and measurement. So this informs creatives and elevates experiential programs. And measurements are, are very key, you know, like that's kind of like the end after you like have completed your, your activation, they kind of track some of the numbers, like how many impressions did you make, what you can do better, what you didn't do right, you know, things like that. So measurements are super important to kind of improve and see what you can, you know, uh, do better next time. Uh, creative ideation and design. And this is kind of where I'm at. Um, so we des uh, the designs, the attendee experience and, and the physical environments. Uh, we also have a department that does creative technology. And I think this would kind of be, I know some of you guys do um, the UX UI design. We actually have some designers that are UX UI designers and they kind of work in this department. So they integrate, you know, the latest tech to create, enhance, extend, or amplify the experience. We have a team dedicated, dedicated to content design and production. So this develops engaging content that speaks to your audience. We have five fabrication warehouse, um, and we also, and logistics. So this builds all related assets, you know, pretty much they build everything that we design and, and create, and they ultimately kind of bring it uh, to life. And then we have the event production and those, that group of people, which is a large group of people, they help build it like, and set it up, you know, work the experience and then take it down and ship it out. So that's a huge team in itself. So these are kind of like all the departments at, at Sparks. Um, and then some of the things that, uh, that I kind of work on and kind of like the different markets. Um, so we do trade shows and exhibits, um, conferences, meetings, um, brand act environments and retail, activation and mobile tours, and then some content. All right, this is... This is the project section. Here we go. I'm going to show you some of the stuff that we've been doing, some cool stuff. Um, oh, actually, 
before we get into the cool stuff, I kind of wanted to show you guys the process. I think this is super important and I'm sure, you know, you guys have probably learned a lot of this stuff um, in your classes or, or in your past classes, but this is an important aspect of design. So, um, you know, just to kind of show you the process that we do. And I think, you know, everybody's process is maybe a slightly different, but a lot of the core elements are still the same. So one, we start off with a project brief. Um, and this, you know, you guys all know this. This is essentially like your teacher telling you, um, here you go, here's your homework. And it lists all the stuff that you need. So just think of that with a client, they call it a brief rather than our homework. Um, so the design brief is a document that defines the core details of your upcoming design project. This includes goals, um, scope of work, strategy, it needs to define what you as a designer need to do and within what constraints. In many ways, it works like a roadmap or a blueprint informing design decisions and guiding the overall workflow of your project from conception to completion. So like I said, you'll have your project overview in there, like what are you building? You've got your goals. Uh, let's increase brand awareness. You've got your scope, roles and responsibilities. And then, of course, budget and schedule and hitting those milestones and being in budget, a very important part. Um, so then after that, we go into concepting. We do a little ideation. We put some, a bunch of pretty images together, those mood boards. Um, after that, we go into the design phase, floor plans, sketches, modeling. And then three and four, I feel like these are, these are ones that could switch. Ideally, we want to do the estimating before we do the presentation, just because you present something and then your account team gets on your ass because it's over budget and then you've already presented to the client and then everybody's looking bad. So um, a lot of times we like to you know, do the estimating first, uh, make sure we're in budget and then present to the client. But you know, like I said, all projects are different. So sometimes we'll end up doing the presentation then doing the estimates. And so it kind of just depends. After that, we do approvals, client signs off on that. Then we go to the build, produce, and that's kind of where you do a little value engineering. The shop build do, does the drawings and then they ultimately build it. Uh, and then finally, you know, you activate, you go ahead and launch whatever, uh, whatever you, event or, or thing you're doing, whether it's public or private, but that's the activation. So this is the process. This, I have seven steps, some may have six, it's, but the, the core elements, the skeleton, that's, this is kind of it. So this, uh, this is a super cool project. This is actually one of the first projects I worked on uh, when I went to Sparks. Um, so this is an annual developer conference and it's over 10,000 people in attendance. Um, it's up in, uh, it's over 10 and a half acres of land up in uh, the Shoreline Amphitheater property in Mountain View, which is up in uh, Northern California. Uh, you know, we bring 10,000 developers from around the world. This event includes in-depth talks, immersive hands-on learning uh, with Google experts, and an exclusive look um, at all the latest like products that Google's launching, all the hardware um, uh, products and features. So it usually starts off with a, um, a large keynote presentation. Um, you know, we end up designing the stage and what it looks like. Uh, they bring out their C-level execs and kind of go over like all the latest products that they're launching. After that, people kind of break out into these areas called breakout rooms, which are like smaller seminars. And they talk to them about certain products. So it's like a little more focused group. Um, and then like the rest of the space is designed to like showcase product. Um, and then, uh, you know, we on the design team are responsible for the look and feel of everything from wayfinding to product placements to even the large structures. So everything is designed by us. So like kind of starting with the process of what I showed you, the, you know, the process, um, you know, we look at a, uh, we start with a, um, you know, a look and feel page, a mood board imagery. And so, you know, if you're not already using Pinterest to find your images and look for good images, you better start now because that's where a lot of the stuff starts um, is finding cool images that you think that could work or something that cool. You're like, oh, that 
if I could build it this way or make it look this way, we could easily put it in our, in our project. At the same time, we have a team that's probably, you know, it's more of like the graphic designers and the 2D designers, they'll start to develop the color palette if there's not already a color palette um, um, given. Uh, so each project's a little bit different. This one in particular, we kind of developed our own color palette based off of, you know, the, the branding. And then we also look at materials too, like what materials would work best um, for, this, uh, for this project. After that, we get into floor plans um, and we start to kind of like, we start to put some constraints on the project, you know, like we're not going to build something that is 100 feet long by 50 feet wide, you know, we'll start to see, all right, we've got a 40 by 50 meter area, how big's the stage, how many seats we want to put it in, and then we start designing from there. So the floor plans kind of give us a bit um, something to work with. Uh, and then with the, a project this large, this is a huge project, 10,000 people attended this and there's 10 and a half acres of space that we had to design. So obviously, you know, uh, you'll be working with uh, many groups. Um, you, you'll have the client, you'll have your project managers, your 2D designers, your 3D designers, your creative directors. Everybody has an important part, uh, role to play uh, to create one cohesive event. Um, after that, you get into like some of the modeling. Um, so you, they give you some, they, you start to dive a little deeper into um, some of these things. So they'll tell you like, we need a screen, we need a table, we need some cabinetry, uh, we need some workstations. And then um, you take that information and you start to design things based off of those uh, parameters. So, uh, and then you also got to design it within, you know, kind of the whole aesthetic that you're going for the materials, all that. And then you can also kind of like, that's why that material page is so important because everybody's working on their own areas. And sometimes you don't have a chance to look over somebody's shoulder. So if you're referencing that document that kind of has all the materials and things like that, a lot of times these will end up looking very similar. So, Everyone has their own areas and collectively we tried to create something like this. Um, so this is the entire space. Uh, we had seven breakout areas, which are these large tent structures. You know, we had to figure out what exactly we wanted the tents to look like. Um, we decided to go with A-frame tents, these graphic treatments that were applied to the sides and on top. Um, they actually um, were like mesh, mesh material so that we had the sun um, creating different patterns on the ground with the colors. Um, these areas were called uh, sandbox domes, which had all the product showcase. Um, this was the uh, boardwalk where you would like kind of walk down and then you, you know, go into your respected zones and things like that. Um, and so there was a lot of lounge space in here as well, because, you know, despite everybody kind of coming in here and having fun and, and, you know, enjoying this experience, a lot of these people are actually working uh, that go to these events. So uh, most of these events have a night event as well. And this is one of the cooler parts of like working these large events. Um, so like this one, you know, it's uh, a day to night transformation from develop concert uh, conference to festival, uh, complete with entertainment, art installations, arcades, roller rink, uh, culinary fair, you know, a bunch of stuff. I mean, we essentially look at like kind of something like Coachella and see if we can kind of bring it to this developer conference. Um, another thing that's super cool too, is I've actually seen quite a few, like essentially like private concerts because of these events that I've worked at. Um, this event in particular, they had LCD sound system playing for everybody in attendance. Um, you know, they, they've had Kygo, Gwen Stefani, I saw the Chainsmokers, uh, Bruno Mars, uh, who else, uh, Leon Bridges. So that's another cool experience that, um, that you, get to, you get to experience. You know, it's like they set these big up, uh, events up and then you know, as you work them, you're able to kind of experience it, it as well. Um, so here are some, just like some images of some of the stuff. Um, so this was like that boardwalk area um, right here where you can kind of see um, some lounge furniture for people to kind of hang out and kick back. 
Um, we took over one of the stage areas, turned it into a roller rink. Um, here, up here, we, um, we this was the, uh, the concert, and then this was some, some additional lounge space. If you guys have questions, again, feel free to kind of raise your hand if you have a question about any of these projects. Um, this next one, uh, this one is called Zoomtopia. Um, it's actually the, the, the company Zoom that we're using this uh, product. Uh, this was an annual user conference, over 2000 people in attendance. And this one was all about space. Um, and this theme was actually given to us by the client. And sometimes you'll kind of come up with concepts when you start with a new client. Sometimes they'll already have a concept in mind. So this one was um, all about space exploration. Um, you know, so once we got that, we started thinking, okay, what can we do cool to make this feel like we're in outer space? You know, astronauts, satellites, lights, kind of like stuff like that. Um, and, uh, I can kind of show you a little bit of what we, we did. This year's Zoom Topia, nothing is impossible. With the eight years of Zoom history, I want to express my sincere appreciation. Yeah, so it was a it was a annual user conference. Um, we had an expo hall. We had a concert. Um, uh, we had that large stage um, that he was presenting on. That was the keynote presentation where we kind of made it look a little spacey. Um, there was a ton of stuff uh, that we had done here. There was even a, a live orchestra, like in the beginning of the keynote presentation. They had I think uh, they played like the Star Wars theme song. Um, and had like a whole orchestra playing over Zoom call. And then there was also um, a concert featuring uh, Snoop Dogg and Leonard Skinner. And this one, I'm telling you, this one was like, was pretty crazy. Um, and you just never know sometimes what to expect at, uh, at these events. I remember, uh, what was it? We had all these brand ambassadors. That kind of, I think you kind of saw that image of like a brand ambassador in a space suit. So um, they, we had the brand ambassadors in space suits in the concert area, which is down here below um, in this, uh, this is the concert area. And so Snoop Dogg was up there on stage and he saw the, um, the astronauts. And at the time he was smoking weed up on stage. And he, I mean, he's got like his own weed guy, blunt guy, and he was smoking up there. And he saw the astronauts and he said, let's bring these guys up here and take them to the moon. And so they all got up there and he's just started passing the blunt from one astronaut to another. And it was pretty wild. I remember like we were on the radio or at least uh, some of our event folks were on the radio saying, what do we do? Do we take them down? Do we like, or at least the, uh, the brand ambassadors, because these are essentially like employees working this event. We ultimately didn't do anything. We let them have a good time. I mean, if I was up there, I'm not going to say no to smoking weed with Snoop Dogg, you know? So it was pretty cool. And it was, uh, I mean, this, this event in itself was pretty wild. I mean, they had dancers on poles. So you just never know what to expect at, um, at some of these events. Um, so this is a, this is a view of like the expo hall. Um, so this was a really cool entrance that we had done, um, where this was like all like an led curtain, um, and it had like led lights and we made it twinkle because remember this was all space themed. So we wanted to kind of feel like the galaxy. We like pumped in some fog. We had those lights twinkling and it was really like a blackout space. And when you walked in, you essentially kind of felt like you were in the galaxy. And then you walked in, we had some like Zoom rooms where they would showcase Zoom's capability. We had this area called Mission Control up here where, um, where it was essentially like the information area uh, where you kind of come, but it looked like we had like a giant rocket ship um, that was built. 
Um, so are really just kind of playing up that theme. I mean, some of these um, theaters that we had, one was called Lightspeed Constellation Theater. Um, and so it, again, we're just trying to make it feel as, as spacey as we can. Uh, so here's some some cool images we thought. So this is like an up close shot of the mission control. We've got the rocket ship right here. And I think I, I touched on this a little bit earlier in the process is where we like value engineer things. And, and Wesley and I were kind of speaking uh, prior to this about how materials are just so hard to come by nowadays. Um, and some are just extremely expensive. So we've got to kind of figure out ways to make things look the way we want to using kind of more readily available materials or things. I mean, we tried to make this look like, you know, uh, the, the area where the, the spaceships launch from. I mean, this is just scaffolding. You know, we bought scaffolding, painted it at white. Um, these like little tubings right here that were hanging down. This is just duct work. Um, so just trying to find smart ways to like make things look, you know, high end, or at least make things look custom without being so custom. Um, this over here, which was a, a cool Instagrammable moment, you know, everybody wants to have these Instagram moments because they want you to, you know, share their brand, share a cool experience that you had with their brand. Um, and this, this was just, I mean, it was a lot of my time, that's exactly what it was. Um, this, and it was a pain in the ass because this thing took me like eight hours to do. I was doing it by hand, but it's essentially mirror foil. And I just took like a staple gun and kind of stapled it in different directions. And then you kind of put an, uh, uh, a neon uh, sign on there and boom, Instagram will mow. We got an astronaut ne next to you. We found these astronauts for like 500 bucks. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's just getting smart with some things. And even this, this LED curtain thing, I think nobody really uses this LED curtain and there's a lot of it. So we ended up getting it for super cheap. Um, and then lastly, like these blue things, I don't know if you guys know what these are. These are just actually freezer flaps. Um, they just come in different colors. So we kind of used them as a way to like, kind of divide the space. Um, so it's just really figuring out like really cool ways to kind of, uh, best way to say is just value engineer, you know, using readily available materials to make something look uh, super custom. Okay, I'm running on 15 minutes here. So I'll try to kind of speed up some of this stuff and hit you with some, some cool projects. But um, so yeah, here's a, here's a view of the stage. Again, we kind of, you know, really, you got to think about every little detail. You know, we had brand ambassadors drip dressed up as um, astronauts. We brought in like, uh, you can kind of see this a little blurry, but we brought in like uh, satellite dishes and painted them different colors and stuff. Um, we also gave away like little cool pins, you know, like little space helmets, things like that. Everything was fully thought out of. Uh, T-Mobile, this one's a pretty quick one. I'll just kind of fly through this one. Uh, this is exactly what it sounds like. Um, our client is T-Mobile um, and they had a partnership with Taco Bell and they matched the two together and created T-Mobile. Um, so at the time, there's this thing called T-Mobile Tuesdays where um, they, they pretty much just give you free stuff uh, if you're a customer. And so they had a partnership with Taco Bell and every Tuesday they would give out tacos, free tacos. Um, and so they wanted to kind of highlight that partnership in their stores. Um, so we did an activation. So we knew we were going to be handing out tacos. And we also knew that we were going to be handing out like a signature drink called Magenta Freeze. Um, so knowing that we had to kind of come up with a couple different like concepts. And one of the concepts that landed was um, like a Spanish taqueria. Um, so you can kind of see that we created this like Spanish tile using both the logos um, and then kind of just really leaned into that taqueria. Um, um, so here's a, a rendering that I had done for it. This was the Santa Monica um, store. We, we did it in Santa Monica, uh, Chicago, and New York City, um, and they all did it on the same day. So, you know, for, for a couple of days, people can walk in, get a taco, get a magenta freeze, take a little, do a little Instagram moment. I'll show you the Instagram moment. 
uh, we did this little wall here where you could, you know, it's just like a, a backdrop. Um, but the flow, the phones are like blow up balloons and the tacos. So it kind of looks like they're like a thing of balloons of tacos and cell phones. Uh, this was the magenta freeze. We did some wall graphics. And some of the metrics behind this, which were super cool. I mean, we had over 12,000 total visitors, you know, seven and a half thousand tacos were consumed, 6,000 Timo Bell freezes. Uh, we were in 33 articles. We generated 11 and a half million impressions and over 668 million social impressions. So the power of one event is, is, is significant, you know? Um, and that's what a lot of cl our clients want is to create this event that ultimately um, creates brand awareness and it reaches more people um, through like social media and things like that. Um, this one, I'll just kind of fly this one. I just threw in here because this is like finally I had done like event, event, consumer activation. This is actually a trade show that we had done. Um, and I'll just kind of fly by this one. But uh, this one is for a client, Aristocrat Technologies, uh, their gaming client. Um, it was at G2E, which is the Global Gaming Expo, which is all kind of like casino games. Um, and they, you know, this was like the first big show after COVID. COVID pretty much screwed up everything. And for like two years, I mean, you guys were going to school, um, but COVID destroyed the event industry super bad. Um, and, you know, my company laid off a ton of people. Um, I was fortunate enough to keep mine, um, but it, it was tough, man. It was definitely tough for a couple of years and things are kind of roaring back now. But um, yeah, this was one project that uh, was one of the bigger projects we had, or at least I had worked on after kind of the whole COVID thing. So they had like come up with like a new brand, uh, which is like all these pops of colors. Um, and what I kind of thought, you know, I took this brand and came up with a concept around like fun house. Um, so again, concepting, bringing in mood imagery. I found this cool image right here. Another Instagramable moment. This one I think was up in like Palm Springs. This was in the Canes Festival um, and decided, you know, like let's bring in some like reflective material. Uh, you know, we started with floor plans and white model renderings um, just to kind of get a lay of the space. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we do these renderings uh, to show the client exactly what it's going to look like and how it's going to lay it out. So this was like a huge tunnel um, where it was all reflective material. These were large, um, essentially like totems. They were like branding opportunities. Uh, and then, of course, you know, every trade show has its hanging sign to get, you know, ample uh, branding. Uh, here's another view. And then this was kind of like the really powerful moment was when you walked through this tunnel. They also had these gaming uh, cabinets, they call them, that, that were essentially a tunnel as well. So you continued down this path. You walked through the large reflective tunnel and then a lit tunnel. And then you have your, you know, your logo that kind of frames it, that picture up really nicely. Um, okay, this one. Let's see, does anybody have any questions? Um, I know we're on like uh, an hour right now, so I don't want to, you know, put anybody to sleep here. <laughs> uh, there's some stuff in the chat. We can read it to you if you like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's see here. Um, Where is the chat? There's one here. It says, I see you have a wide range of projects other than Nintendo games. What others have you worked on? So I guess we're seeing some of those. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, I've worked on a handful of projects and, you know, we've done, I've done large events and conferences, uh, trade shows where we do individual booths, um, some consumer activations, some permanent installations. I started doing some stuff last year during COVID where we did virtual, where we did some using uh, 3D Vista. Um, so I just kind of wanted to show you guys all the cool stuff and the cool stuff that we've done at our company. But yeah, I mean, I this list could go on and on of all the stuff that I've worked on. Okay, we have another question. What are the challenges you faced in creating brand experience design and what are the peaks? Uh, the challenges, I mean, I, one of the 
biggest challenges is always like people want like the coolest thing ever, you know? And then on top of that, sometimes they don't have the budget to do the coolest thing ever, you know? So like you definitely run into trying to find that balance of like creating something cool and having enough money to do creating cool stuff. Um, and then everybody wants those Instagramable moments. And so, you know, sometimes you fall short, you know, like, I, unfortunately I don't have a million ideas in my head at one time, you know? So like those things become tough when you're like doing them over and over and over, obviously you got to kind of persevere and kind of find other ways to, to get those ideas out. But yeah, sometimes it's definitely a struggle to come up with, with brilliant ideas every time, you know? What are your favorite parts? Um, I think the my some of the favorite parts is one, the design phase, you know, like coming up with, you know, we, we get that brief, we go through the concepting and then we start the modeling and we kind of, you know, uh, produce like phase or, you know, here's uh, phase one. And then we like, you know, do a couple re revisions, but the initial phase where you're kind of like getting all that stuff out and designing a bunch of stuff, that's, that's really cool. And then also like, going and experiencing these um these activations are i'd probably say my favorite because you put so much work and effort into these things and you work really hard on them and when you're able to kind of go out there and experience it and see other people experiencing what you had just created i think that's probably one of my favorite parts great we have a couple more yeah uh, I'm in the industrial design program, but I'm interested and would like to work in this field. What are things that recruiters, companies look for in young designers? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's totally okay to you know be in the industrial and and all of a sudden be like, hey, I I like what you're doing. Um, you know, the the benefit you have is you're coming straight out of college, so like you don't have like 10 years in the industrial program, and then you're learning something completely different. The, I think they understand that like you're coming out of college, you could, they, oh, I wouldn't say they can, you know, they kind of like mold you. Um, and you essentially are, you know, you're a junior designer. So like, you don't have to have all the skills necessary. Um, you're going to learn them. They're going to teach them to you. So I think it, it's, I think just having a good portfolio um, that shows your process work, um, your design capabilities, your skills, I think that's probably beneficial coming out of college. If you choose to go into um, uh, experiential marketing and you're, you know, say you're not, you don't learn all the skills in school for, for that, if that makes sense. All right, and then we'll do one more before we carry on. Let's see here. Um, when you are designing brand experience events, how do you incorporate people's safety and or plan for emergencies? Uh, let me, when you were designing brand. Um, you know, in terms of safety, I mean, you always want to, like, I mean, we do a lot of testing ourselves and making sure that like, okay, we're not doing anything too crazy. You know, like nobody, uh, there's a project in here, I'll show you guys that we have like people, um, like swinging, like as if they had a bat in their hands. Obviously we take the bat out of their hands so they don't use that and they don't hurt somebody, but, you know, creating ample room space for them to kind of do that activation. Um, you know, we always taking into consider ADA and making sure that everybody can kind of uh, experience what we're doing, uh, regardless of whether in they're in a wheelchair or if they got a disability or, or they're normal. So I think you know, we definitely keep that in mind. Um, and we're definitely like kind of, you know, testing some of these out before we just got to go to go to launch. Uh, just to follow up on that, do you have like in house uh, structural engineers or do you or how does that work? Yeah, so we actually have like a team of of drafters and engineers and kind of all that. So we even have engineers that do like the stamp drawings for, you know, different cities and stuff like that. So. Uh, we have a huge team uh, of that. Very cool. All right, so let's continue. Okay, cool. Um, this one, man, this is actually probably the coolest project that I um, 
that we've done at my company, or at least that I, I wasn't like really involved in this. I did like a couple things here and there. So like, I wouldn't even say like I was really on this project, but I was able, I thought I'd throw this in here because I thought it was really cool. Uh, this was Google at CES, Las Vegas. Um, so if you're not familiar with CES, it's the Consumer Electronics Show. There's over 180,000 people that kind of attend this over, I think it's like a four, three, four day, um, uh, what do you call it? Three, four day event. Um, and what we ended up doing is Google was making a big push to um, launch, or they had already launched their assistant and their assistant kind of was like in a battle with Amazon, the Amazon Alexa. Um, anyways, they really wanted to make a big push for the Hey Google Assistant. Um, so this was kind of like their big, big project or like a big, uh, oh, see my Google device is talking to me. So, <laughs> but this was kind of like their big coming out party. Um, we like all on the bottom was like all like product showcase. Um, we had different activations down there. The entire second floor was a ro like a roller coaster ride. It wasn't very fast. It like went very so, but it was a roller coaster ride. Um, okay, well, yeah. So, um, okay, so kind of just to give you like an overview of like this, and I'll, I'm going to show you a video of kind of the stuff, but this was a, a, a three, 36,000 foot uh, experience, uh, immersive ride experience of all things, Google Assistant featuring animatronics, you know, we had photo ops, custom media consoles, um, down below was an at home and in car demos, uh, also featured uh, partner device galleries we had like a little studio where we had like a, a chef do a um, like a cooking series um, they also had live podcast um, they had a guided meditation and then this project was so big that it took over the entire city of las vegas or at least the strip uh, we had uh we had vinyl wrapped the uh, monorails I was taking that said, Hey Google, every billboard on the strip said, Hey Google. I mean, you, you couldn't walk 10 feet without saying, seeing something that said, Hey Google. So big, big um, uh, undertaking. So some of the, uh, some of the things, uh, so the ride is a heart a heartwarming journey about a fictional family managing their hectic day using Google assistant. Um, so we kind of took um, attendees like on a ride um, that kind of showed, you know, this, this crazy life. Um, so in this um, area, we had unexpected experiences in the line queue. Uh, we had an interactive animatronic grandma with like an actor on the other line. So anytime you were in line, he would interact with you on the other side through the grandma. Um, and then uh, I'll show you a video, but like, at the end of the ride, um, the story goes like they're buying a cake for grandmother uh, and they go to a, uh, a cake shop that uh, everything's in French. And so part of the Google Assistant is that you can use translation to translate um, any language. Um, so they tied, after you got off the ride, it dumped you off into a, uh, a pastry shop where we had a chef who only spoke French and the way to order things was you had to use the Google assistant. So everything tied together very nicely, the, the whole story um, and everything was very well curated. Um, this also won like a bunch of awards, you know, best um, trade show of the decade, best B2B um, and just, it, it did really well. And so here I'll, I'll play a, um, so these are some images here. This is that animatronic grandmother. So she would move around and she had like an actor talking. Um, this is like the back of the, the booth with some large branding. We also had some like ancillary uh, areas. Um, so like this was a large gumball machine where you would put a coin in and out pops like um, a Google, you would get a prize, like whether it's like a gift card for Google or a Google device or like one of their partners um, uh, products that features a Google assistant. They also built this like um, like little tiny city um, that had everything where, I mean, little sm smoke was coming out of the, the buildings, like the billboards would say certain things, like trains were running through, it was super detailed and super cool. Um, and then this was kind of a view of the inside of the, um, of the ride. And then I will play this video. Uh, 
uh, for it. This is a video that uh, my company made for this event. Oh, hello, children. Would you like to hear a story? Wait, what? Hey everybody, look, there's a camera. Smile, make it look like you're having the time of your life. And now, cue the results. And those are kind of some metrics at the end that we took. Um, but I mean, everything was curated from this. I remember they also had like a composer like build the, the song to this ride. Um, they also had somebody, you know, writing the lyrics to this, to this song. Um, so, you know, I, I think the inspiration was taken from like, it's a small world and it very much felt like that. So super cool experience. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, and I'll, I'll just kind of fly by the this stuff. This is like some digital experiences we did. I know, um, you know, some of you guys are, have been taking maybe the UX UI design. So uh, some of this kind of pertains to you. So we also do digital experiences. Um, and I've been fortunate to kind of work on some of these things. So this one was actually um, a T-Mobile like got the sponsorship rights to uh, Safeco Field in Seattle. So part of that sponsorship is they get an area on center field called the pen. And what we did is they essentially wanted to kind of reimagine the fan experience, um, you know, because I'm a baseball fan and, you know, anytime, sometimes I go to these games, you know, they're not always the, the I would say they're the most exciting Um and I think a lot of people, you know, also go to these games, you know, because they're dragged by, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend or some friends, things like that. So we want to do something fun and kind of get fans excited about coming to the stadium. Uh, so we created three different experiences. One, um, and these experiences kind of like uh, ultimately you're able to kind of show your skills, you know, um, everybody kind of likes a good competition. Um, and so these uh, interactives um, kind of, you know, piggyback off that. So we utilize uh, real-time uh, camera vision technology and motion tracking and AR computing to capture and analyze a fan's swing as a baseball is thrown from a digital pitcher. So you can kind of see right here that there's a pitcher on a mound and then you're in this batter box. And as the pitch is thrown, you kind of like throw your hands and swing at the ball. And so based off, we have some cameras in different directions based off of your swing and how fast and how, like what direction it is, it kind of predicts how far, what direction it's going to go. Ultimately, you kind of receive a shareable digital baseball card. Um, again, kind of, you know, you're able to kind of share that little moment. Um, this next one, uh, it's very similar. It's just kind of like the reverse. So instead of the hitter, now you're the pitcher. And so you kind of like take the ball in your hand. It's all virtual. You throw it based off of your, the direction of your arm, the movement. It kind of dictates how fast you can throw and what you're throwing. Um, and then lastly, we did like a bobblehead experience. Um, so this was more kind of like really ta tailored towards a photograph moment. Um, you like step into this, uh, booth, um, you pick, you like kind of line your head up and then you pick like a, a different body type. Um, and then ultimately you would put your head on a, like a body, like a Mariner's body, and then give you like a little gif of it bob bobbling. So you're like essentially just a virtual bobblehead. Um, okay. And 
I'm going to show you guys one last project because I think this one is, um, again, super relevant for like the interactive experience. Uh, this was one I just worked on. And for those that kind of want to do the experience, uh, go ahead and, you know, you guys can pull out your phones and go ahead and scan this um, QR code right now. And then you'll kind of get an idea of exactly how this experience um, takes place. So uh, this digital experience uh, was centered around Las Vegas Golden Knights who call uh, T-Mobile Arena their home. Uh, it included the knight as a character in a photo op. Uh, which promoted the partnership with the hockey team, as well as, you know, pushing brand awareness. Um, so we had a bunch of call to actions, you know, one on the media mesh on the exterior of the screen, and then, um, you know, a bunch of like digital signage and things like that. But anyways, you, you scan the QR code, and then for those that uh, are doing it or haven't done it, you essentially kind of get a photo experience. So um, this is kind of like the process work that goes into the UI design. Um, and then I kind of just helped with a little bit of the user experience. Um, so, you know, you, you, you scan the QR code, we've got a loading page. Here's the, um, the, the load, the, the start of the experience. You have the night, um, and then kind of like, you know, somebody posing with it. This is our ultimate goal. We wanted a photo experience. We had different poses for the night. And then we also created a large uh, digital, uh, like a, a media um, uh, a clip. So that's some of the process work that went into creating this, um, this experience. Um, so I, I thought it was you know, helpful given that, like I've kind of done some critiques in some of these classes before and, uh, and, they, did, um, and they did some UX UI design. So I thought this would be beneficial. Um, okay, so I think, where am I, I think, uh, I think that's probably, I mean, I have one more project. Um, I think we kind of like touched on enough stuff because, uh, you know, I hit a little bit of everything. I think, um, I just wasn't sure what we were doing on time in terms of all of that. So, um, I think, you know, I think that I had enough you know, projects to kind of give you an idea of, you know, the stuff that I work on, you know, we do trade shows, we do large conferences, we do permanent installations, retail, um, some, uh, some digital experiences. So, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of gives you an idea of like a, a designer and experiential marketing. Um, and then, you know, I also, like I said, I thought it was beneficial for you guys to kind of know exactly how I got there and just know that, you know, hey, I didn't have it all figured out when I graduated, but here I am, you know, eight years later. And uh, I don't know, I, I think I might've figured out a little bit, but I still got a lot of stuff to learn. 